Okay, so this is the lecture for um, sport and performance psychology on the uh, psychology of flow and peak experiences. We're going to focus mainly on sport, um, but we should note at the beginning that uh, it's just as applicable to exercise situations, uh, but the example that I use will be mainly from sport. Um, if we progress into the aims, we need to uh, work out what flow is and how it's emerged from literature um, looking at peak experience, uh, peak performance, and then uh, that delivered us to um, understanding of flow. We will look at um, the differences between those concepts and uh, some variables that are associated with them in terms of causing or at least um, increasing the likelihood of flow being experienced. We're going to look at how we measure it or attempt to measure it and then towards the end um, some factors which are believed to facilitate or inhibit flow from occurring. Um, the reason we care so much about flow is that it seems to uh, accompany peak performance and so a lot of people believe that if you can uh, produce flow you can produce peak performance and in elite athletes that is very desirable. So if we stop for a moment and just imagine how this ever happened to ourselves uh, it could be in sport, it could be in music or um, playing a computer game um, and I'm particularly um, convinced that it happens to most of us when we're driving because um, whilst we wouldn't, uh, there's no competition to prove it we all have to become um, quite good at driving just to, just to survive, just to get by so um, there are quite long periods sometimes where we're driving and we don't um, recall having made a decision or having uh, been conscious of what we were doing uh, in regard to controlling the car may even have had time to think about other things and to drift off and daydream and that could be um, close to an experience of flow whereby the task in hand was completely under control and there was no question or, or doubt whatsoever um, some people um, have talked about it in computer games as being um, it, again everything just happens and it's, you're just playing and whatever um, is thrown at you you're able to deal with it um, and you know, as, as an experience seems to be something that you're convinced you can deal with any challenges that come up so that confidence that comes with it is an important aspect. So if you just cast your mind back to situations where you've been playing uh, sport or music or even recently I had the experience of just writing several hundred words without um, stopping to think and as I looked back at it it was actually quite good writing so it could even be that it's something which uh, is an academic pursuit. So the, the key idea here is that you've performed to a very high level without any um, mental efforts or um, control being exerted. The majority of the work in flow has been uh, qualitative and exploratory and it continues to be so um, we, we find that many of the papers remain qualitative and that's not ideal because it's, it's we're meant to be able to get to the point where we can measure it and form theories and hypotheses and then test those theories and hypotheses but part of the problem is the way it's been studied um, and the way it's been conceptualised kind of prevents that from happening so um, it's very difficult to falsify um, any of the claims made about flow at the moment um, and you know this is a great example of how difficult it is to measure things in psychology um, which you know causes all the problems that we're, we're talking about here. The reason it's uh, so applicable to sport is because it's heavily grounded in positive psychology, the idea of looking at people's strengths and good attributes rather than trying to diagnose what's wrong all the time. Um, and it's a very sort of substantial movement and it's uh, gaining popularity at least. Um, it probably shouldn't um, need a separate identity, it should all be psychology, you know, what's wrong with you and what's, what's good about you. But uh, there was a necessity in the 80s and 90s to try and focus on positive psychology and flow emerge from that as being a good experience and something that accompanies peak performance. Um, unsurprisingly, we, we do have questionnaires to measure flow. Um, and again, uh, sometimes viewing it as a personality trait, wherein uh, people are more prone to experience flow, and sometimes viewing it as a state in which we can look back at a recent experience and say, um, how much were you experiencing flow in that moment? Um, the problem is that you can't easily measure flow 
when it's being experienced. You can't stop someone to give them the questionnaire, and by definition, if you did, you would be breaking their flow state. So we always have to um, look back, at the moment anyway, at, at when it has occurred, and then try and work out um, if that person was in flow or not. What we can do um, with our interviews and questionnaires is try and work out which factors uh, led to the experience of flow. And again, that was accompanying peak performance. So if we can cause flow and cause peak performance by making sure those factors are in place, then we're in very good shape. So flow focuses on the subjective experience and uh, we can try and sort of work out what, what's encompassed within that by thinking about the thoughts that you actually have and are aware of um, in your cognition. Um, and then there are thoughts in cognition again that are, are implicit and things that you don't consciously control and you may not even be aware of unless you search for them and try and become conscious of them. But that's all falling under cognition. It's a uh, logical um, flow of information. Uh, whereas affective states might include affect, mood and emotions. They're more difficult to control, I imagine. Um, uh, but they also are a key part of subjective experience. So the degree to which you can think clearly, for example, might be determined by the mood that you're in. And that might be determined by how well you slept and what food you've eaten. So uh, that's an important angle of uh, the affective states and an important link to physiology, which we often overlook. And then also we can look at the behaviour being exhibited um, in terms of exactly what happened and in terms of the outcomes, whether they were desirable or undesirable. And that triad um, can, can constitute the subjective experience a person is aware of. And if we study that, we often uh, find ourselves coming in to talk about things like flow. But of course, really, um, we end up as well in the area of phenomenology, which focuses on people's moment-to-moment -moment subjective experiences. And there's a whole philosophy of science, a whole um, area of science, not just in sports psychology, where people only study that and imagine or claim that everything else is kind of um, not for scientific study because psychology must be unique to the individual. So there's a big movement um, within it, uh, and flow again fits into that movement very nicely. Um, but you'll notice that since its inception, since it um, was invented to be um, a subjective experience, we've tried to objectify and look at um, similarities between people and make generalizations which um, moves away from a unique subjective experience and turns it into something which is universal. So the, the background would be that um, Mikhail Chitzen uh, Mihaly set out to study um, people who were performing uh, to a very high level in a number of areas, so musicians, uh, chess grandmasters, brain surgeons, maybe fighter pilots, and he included some elite athletes, but it was a very big, big sample. And in doing that and looking at the um, positive psychology of peak performance, he uh, gradually honed in on this concept of flow. Now it sits neatly between um, peak experience, which is just a, a pleasurable uh, experience where you might have the, the best experience you can have, basically. In terms, it might be happiness, fulfillment, it might be something which you don't necessarily contribute to, but is, is provided for you. So play, playing your favourite sport with your favourite player might be a, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that you just sit back and enjoy. And that's contrasted against peak performance, um, where you simply perform at the absolute best of your ability. Um, and one of the reasons we tend to focus on elite athletes is because we reason that elite athletes will experience peak performance more frequently. They'll be constantly pursuing um, better and higher levels. And by the definition of being elite, they'll be better than other people at their particular sport. So um, that's one reason why you see more studies focusing on elite athletes. But um, it doesn't rule out that anybody can experience flow. We just seem to believe it's more common in elite athletes. So flow sits neatly between those where you are simultaneously performing to the best of your ability, and maybe even beyond what you thought you were capable of, and it's very enjoyable. And it must be possible 
to have both separately. So you can have peak experience without performing at all or um, without performing to your best. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm aware, I've heard of players who have quite enjoyed playing badly and, and not worrying about it. Um, for example, if the pressure has been taken off. And I've also heard of people who have uh, performed to a very high level, um, but it's been incredibly difficult. So um, they've had to make a huge mental effort. Uh, and I can, I can almost imagine a sport like weightlifting would be um, would fit into this, where you have to sometimes just um, really make a mental and physical effort. It might not be particularly pleasurable, but that's sometimes a way to produce your best performance. However, flow needs to to con contain both. So we, they've been studied separately, um, so peak performance was an area of literature um, where you, as I said, transcend what you're used to and what would be your normal, maybe even uh, transcend what you thought you were capable of. Uh, peak experience is something very subjective and very pleasurable uh, and it might be separate from performance. And flow is where those two things are linked. And a key um, assumption in the theory, which is very rarely put into words, is that it might be a kind of reward system for um, for being able to uh, perform at that high level. Um, so people explain, uh, explain it as being very pleasurable, um, and it feels like a reward. It's very rewarding. You want to go and do it again immediately. So it might be that um, it's our our body's way, our brain's way of, of making peak performance um, rewarding. Um, focusing on peak performance for a second, there are different types of peak performance, again, in different domains. Um, and again, I've said it could be personal best or it could be um, world best. Um, or it might be some task where um, there is an objective way of measuring it, in which case you can have an absolute measurement and you could get the, the world best score or the world best time. And so that would count as peak performance. Um, it, it can involve mental and cognitive effort, and it can be very deliberate. Um, and it's also mentioned in the same breath as ideas such as um, self-actualization, where you are becoming the person you want to be, and the ideal um, self. That's the idea in, in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And it, um, when people have talked about peak performance, which, if we're honest, seems to have gone out of fashion, it's, it's talked about less. Uh, in these terms, in, in psychological terms, um, then this is what they're talking about. So peak experience, if we just pause for a second, um, you'll notice that it, it contains a very similar subjective experience, um, subjective descriptors to flow. So you, you um, lose fear and, and you stop being self-conscious. You don't think about what's going on, you just appreciate it. You're immersed in the situation. Uh, and your focus is non-distractable and, and so it's a very tight focus. Um, it can be effortless. Uh, you can feel in control and again, therefore not have self-doubt. Some people talk about um, time flying or time slowing down when they're having a peak experience. Um, and sometimes people just talk about feeling at one with um, whatever they're doing or at one with the universe. Um, and it's often uh, completely unique, um, impossible to replicate and it's not something you can do on purpose. So big experience um, contains these descriptors and if you are listening in the concentration lecture you'll see some similarities to flow and you'll see some similarities as we go through this lecture. Um, so it's a fulfilling, significant, maybe even spiritual experience but um, again in sport uh, flow really has just come to dominate and big experience seems to have fallen out of favour as a, as a concept to investigate. So, uh, Chick's M. uh conceptualization of flow is a, it's a holistic, uh, motivating sensation that people feel when they are totally involved and possibly even on automatic pilot. Um, and we've talked before about how that stems from perceiving, not necessarily um, in their objective terms, but perceiving that the level of challenge uh, meets your capability. Um, and so, in the process of experiencing flow, what you're doing um, becomes all that you're aware of and you stop having to worry about the consequences, um, you stop having to worry about taking control and trying to achieve it, it's simply um, run the same and, and any kind of conscious thought just disappears. So that also gets called being kind of 
at one with the task. Um, in that respect, people uh, feel they have clear and unambiguous goals. They just know what they're doing and they get on with it. And in relation to that, they therefore just get very simple feedback that what they're doing is working and they're happy. So because they have this oneness with the task and they know their goals and they're achieving their goals and they're clearly the feedback they're getting from the task is that they're achieving their goals, that leads to this uh, concentration and this wonderful feeling of being in control without having to try. It's just everything's going exactly as planned. And um, we interviewed some golfers recently about this and they would talk in very particular terms about not only being able to see in their mind the exact shot they wanted to hit, but um, they could then just simply hit it and uh, to the point where they felt like almost the ball was under their control after, the, after it had left their clubs. They would look up at the ball that flew away and say, that needs to turn right, and it would turn right. Now, of course, that they aren't controlling the ball, but it's just this sense that you're in total control of the environment and what you want to happen happens. Now, if that's the case, there's no reason to doubt yourself or to analyse how well or how badly it's going and what to do differently. So any self-consciousness simply evaporates. Um, the dimension of, of time distortion, as I've mentioned, can go both ways. So some people say it speeds up and some say it slows down. And we've never quite resolved that. Um, and maybe that's uh, right and proper aspects of it. The, the last sort of characteristic is that it's inherently rewarding. It's a pleasurable experience. So you can have all those things and if it wasn't pleasant, it wouldn't be slow. If we dig deeper into Sikhsen Mahali's writing, and there is a lot of it, he tends to write uh, books and book chapters, and they tend to be quite long. So, And, and of course they're not always, um, as a result, peer-reviewed, um, so there's not a lot of requirement on him to be um, particular and focused, um, but it's, it's still very influential writing, a very influential concept. If we dig deeper, we find that there are some conditions that lead to flow and then the characteristics of flow. So challenge skills balance, having clear goals and having unambiguous feedback are conditions that lead to flow, whereas the characteristics would be uh, the emerging of action and awareness, concentration, etc. So um, as you can tell by the colour scheme, this is a picture from the Weinberg and Guild book just trying to expand on the challenge skills balance. So you can split both into uh, high and low, uh, high challenge, low challenge, high skill, low skill. And if you are in a situation where the challenge is perceived to be high, but your skills are suitably high to match, that would be flow. Uh, in contrast, if the challenge is high, you don't feel you can match that, then you might experience anxiety or want to give up. Um, if you uh, feel that you have, haven't got the skills and there's no challenge in front of you anyway, you might not care and not want to do anything, and that might be something like apathy or a motivation from the motivation lectures. And if your skills are too high for the task at hand and the challenge is too low for your skills, you may simply be bored and again not want to engage and, and not try. So this has been a key defining feature really of flow research. Uh, just really we're just going to work through and provide some expansion and, and quotes uh, so you can back up anything you write about this. Uh, it has been written about extensively and sometimes in conflicting terms, but we can draw out the similarities for now. And if you want to dig deeper, um, I can direct you to some papers and I can put some papers on Moodle which you can read and draw differences between. So, for example, Clear Goals has been uh, neatly um, defined by Jackson and Kimichek. Sue Jackson has been another very influential writer here. So it's a better person knows and understands the goals for activity. Um, here she's more likely to become engaged, uh, so it's very important. And goal setting research also says that having clear goals is important just in general, but it becomes a key attribute of flow because it enables you to um, focus on a couple of things and just listen to those, the feedback from those and not worry about uh, everything else. And of course there are many attractions in sport and life, uh, and, many not, and again, from the concentration lecture, those attractions can be uh, internal and thoughts and feelings and, and worries, or they can be external. Um, and of course, so that links to the idea of the feedback because your focus is just directed to those few things. And if the information you're getting from the environment is 
appropriate and only on the, your the things that you have goals to to achieve, then you're in quite good shape. And so these things should, in, in principle, increase the likelihood of flow occurring. And again, so we see that action and awareness seem to merge, which is a hard concept sometimes to grasp. But um, yeah, the idea is that all you're thinking about is what you're doing, and the sooner have you thought it, that it's happened. And in fact, sometimes you're even becoming aware of what's happening after it's happened. That's how um, completely enmeshed what's happening is the task and the action with your awareness. So you're fully focused on the task at hand. Um, and again, that should come from clear goals and clear feedback. But this sense of control is important. And again, uh, you, you probably couldn't achieve flow and you couldn't um, lose that self-awareness and turn off that analytical thinking if you didn't feel completely in control and it was effortless. And this is one of the areas where there's a, a strong paradox because whilst simultaneously being in control, people report that they're not trying to be in control. It's just this accidental coincidence. It just happens and it feels, some people report that it feels out of their control. So one of the golfers we interviewed in our research um, compared this uh, this paradox of control to um, a classic experience of wanting to go out and, and uh, find a girl to take home, for example, or a future girlfriend. He said, if you're looking for that to happen, it, it simply doesn't happen. If you just go out to have fun and spend time with your friends, um, ironically, that's often uh, when you meet someone and have to leave your friends behind. So the result of, of those experiences, there's, there's no need to switch on your analytical brain, there's no need to worry about the consequences for yourself, what people are going to think of you. So that doesn't happen, it just switches off, but it's not necessary. Um, one of the more interesting aspects is this idea of, of the time changing and, and speeding up or slowing down. Um, and so it could be that a, a marathon feels like it's taken minutes, or it could be that 100 meters um, feels like it's slowed down and, and just taken forever. Uh, we don't know which way it, it goes more commonly, we just know that people who experience flow uh, report that, that time is no longer something they were conscious of or, or keeping track of. So really hopefully we've, we've reinforced these key points and provided you with some references to back them up. There remain many unanswered questions in relation to flow though. So the different people experience it differently, um, the different playing styles lead to different um, types of flow. Uh, can flow vary in intensity? Can, it, can you be in a, a loose, uh, fragile form of flow, or can you be in a very tight and unbreakable type of flow? And um, given that we've used questionnaires to measure flow, is there a particular personality or a particular set of mental skills and attributes that disposes you to experience flow? In fact, there are many more questions that are unanswered, and we'll put some of those back up at the end of the lecture just to um, point you towards avenues for research if that's where you want to go. So measuring flow is extremely problematic, as I mentioned at the start, because it's uh, inherently subjective and completely unique, and in principle, each person should experience it differently, which is why, in a way, it's very ironic that we then um, just out of sheer habit in psychology, have developed questionnaires to measure it. And uh, you know, the questionnaires are extremely convenient, uh, easy to use, and they, they manage to turn something which is subjective into objective numbers that we can then compare and use to predict things. Um, and in some cases, you can even develop a questionnaire and then charge other people for, for using it and, and turn it into a money making venture. So. Um, that seems to be what's happened in, in flow research, and so we have these scales, but a key criticism could be that they a, a big departure from the original definition of flow. Now, of course, that could be um, debated, and it could be a bonus intention, but if you look at it as a deeply subjective experience, there's, there's no way it should be then something you, which you can um, turn into a questionnaire, which enables you to take an average of a whole group of people, and it enables you to make claims that one person experiences flow more than the next person. 
explore what it does allow us um, to look at the disposition or personality angle is to try and identify someone who seems more prone to experience flow, disposition or flow state scale. Um, and that's perhaps more plausible as, as a um, questionnaire. So uh, even quite recently we've got, um, again because we like our correlations, we can see that people who experience flow, for example, tend to be the same people who score high on mental toughness questionnaires. So maybe the attributes of mental toughness um, are the same attributes that lead to increased flow experiences. If we look for a method that perhaps is closer to um, you know, what flow is and how it should be measured, we could um, give someone experience sampling where we just literally give them a beeper that goes off at uh, random points and ask them to record exactly their subjective experience every time that beeper goes off. So of course we'll be breaking it each time it goes off, but it's, it's random and so we'll be finding out um, what they're thinking at that point in time. Another thing we can do, uh, and what we frequently do, is to ask people afterwards, um, did you experience flow in that particular event? What was it like? Um, how did it play out? And what factors led to it? What factors seem to have um, taken you out of it afterwards? Um, and I think we've discussed in, in class sometimes the possibility of, of getting people to just simply narrate their experience, to have a stream of consciousness, which would be, slight, again, slightly more up-to-date and more valid, because if you can train someone to unconsciously talk out loud and, and just simply record that information, then we might be able to track exactly what's going on whilst they're in a flow state. Um, and, and there are probably degrees of uh, in-between. If you wanted to really push the area, you know, we could uh, perhaps design mobile um, brain scanning equipment which might look for particular types of brain waves or particular patterns of brain activation which we you know, might find synonymous with the flow experience and if so a person was participating in their sport and um, showed those brain waves or showed that um, activation pattern then we could perhaps infer that they were in flow or something very close to it. Uh, to my knowledge that certainly happened, hasn't, hasn't happened in sport yet. Um, because we typically haven't got mobile devices that can do that. The work in sport has been fairly recent, so if we look at um, Chitin Mahali writing since the 70s, it was really Sue Jackson who brought it more into sport in the 90s. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the work is on elite athletes, um, and sometimes we, um, we would um, combine peak performance and experience um, and just hope that flow is in there somewhere. So um, it's been it's been messy at times, and it's been kind of uh, there are plenty of opportunities to be critical. Uh, but at least we are applying it in sport, and we are um, trying to work out, as I've mentioned, what factors might precipitate flow, and therefore, hopefully, um, lead to elite athletes performing at their absolute best, and and that hopefully would mean medals. Well, uh, sort of an aside for a second is to think about whether um, the proverbial runner's high is a, is a particular example of flow. So um, apparently in some sports, especially endurance sports, um, there can be an experience develops where it's particularly pleasurable and you, um, it, you lose your sense of the pain and effort of, of running, for example. And that was observed by Sachs. Um, and it's it might be a sport-specific example of flow, and that's um, an example of uh, an important area of research is, is to look at how flow might be experienced differently in different sports. Um, so, for example, um, flow in running might be different from flow in squash, might be different from flow in a sport like golf, which is very, very different, and, and yet um, we know that players playing golf frequently talk about getting into a zone or a bubble and uh, even sometimes report that they can tell somebody else is in their zone and that they choose not to interrupt that person and not to talk to them because it would be bad etiquette. Um, so uh, it's, it happens in golf just as it might happen in sort of more intense uh, sports like, like running um, and it must presumably be a different experience in those two sports. 
So once we've managed to grapple with what flow is and try and apply it to sport, um, another area of research has been to try and look at the factors that um, lead to flow, um, the causes, shall we say. And it's, it's, as I say, it's often believed by athletes to be out of their control and coincidental, um, a nice coincidence when it happens. But um, the results we interviewed in our in our recent research um, reported that they could control it, and they were sometimes do deliberate things to try and either um, stay in it or, or cause it. So they might go through a certain preparation to try and cause flow, and and some of them would report um, that they were aware of what was going on, and there were two responses. They would either not think about it and say, I know I'm in the flow, I know I'm in the zone at the moment, don't think about it, just let it happen. And that was an interesting response, given that it's meant to be uncontrollable. Another response was that people would try and make the most of it. So they'd go, I'm in the zone right now, I'm hitting, I can't miss, so I want to try and make as many shots up as I can um, while this is happening. And again, that feels like an example of trying to manage the flow experience. So. On the one hand, it's often viewed as a coincidence, and you can do all the right things that might cause it um, and not experience it. And yet, on the other hand, people sometimes talk about trying to deliberately um, produce flow and manage it when it's happening. Um, before that, because I'm talking about research that um, is soon to be published, um, before that we're looking at um, papers which have talked about causing flow in terms of facilitators, uh, things that might prevent it from happening in the first place and things that might break it when it's happening. Um, so let's go through some of those. Factors that might interfere with flow might be external stresses, um, the crowd being unfavourable or, uh, for example, uh, again going with golf, it might be that the golfer hits what they think is a good shot but the crowd on the green reacts with shock and, and that might break the, the moment for him, so he gets to the green and finds that the ball's in the wrong place, but it was the crowd response that, that broke the, the flow. It could be that um, gusts of wind or camera shutters, uh, uncontrollable events uh, might also snap somebody out of the experience. And I think we've mentioned before about how things like stoppages and injuries can um, cause someone to switch their brain back on and, and so just by doing something slightly differently to what they were doing when it was all working, they, they've lost the pattern, they've lost the, the experience. It could be that someone um, lacks confidence uh, and therefore is unable to reach a flow situation. Um, and that's got to be one of the main reasons because in order to switch off that deliberate thinking brain, um, we often need to feel very confident and assured that we can do what's required of us. And sometimes, if we're honest, um, obviously not being motivated to perform would would also prevent flow from occurring because um, it needs to be something where you want to engage, you want to give your best and meet the challenge. Um, so any perception that there is no challenge or that maybe you don't have the skills we've talked about, you don't um, have clear goals to focus on, any of those things could prevent flow from happening. Um, Adding to that, it could be that um, the person is carrying an injury or tired and that could prevent you from experiencing flow. It could be that you're thinking about the wrong things and you've got worries in your private life or worries at home. Um, any of those uh, frustrations with, with teammates or um, with coaches. Um, and it could just be that someone doesn't get a chance to prepare properly, but then um, you know we should be aware of exceptions to that rule. So that, that the US Masters, I think, recently, uh, Roy McElroy um, was, was late, the alarm didn't go off, and he simply turned up at the course and, and still managed to play very well. So it's possible sometimes that by not having a chance to think, that can actually be something which perhaps leads to peak performance. And you know, like we never got a chance to ask him, but perhaps that was a, a flow experience for him. When you're in flow, it might be that um, your arousal changes, perhaps um, you have to rush and your heart rate goes up, or it might be that you become complacent and, uh, and relax too much out of your kind of performance zone, and that could disrupt the flow experience. It might be uh, there's a, a mistake that happens, so you, and yeah, this is interesting because 
it, again, it, it's a circular definition that you have to be playing well to be in flow. So um, if you're not, then it's simply a peak experience, and that dividing line is, is very slim. So you could be in flow, having a great experience, um, and then make a mistake. And so by definition, you're no longer in flow because you're no longer at the peak of your performance. And yet, um, that you might still be having a good time and enjoying it. So is it flow? Is it peak performance? I've uh, honestly spoken to people who say when they're in flow, they don't mind making mistakes. So they might hit a terrible shot and see the ball go into the long grass in golf again uh, and say, it's okay, I can hit the ball from there, no problem at all. Whereas if you're not in flow, you might judge that to be a terrible situation and, and the end of the day's work. Of course, um, criticism from feedback, criticism from coaches, any of those things could um, disrupt the experience as well and that's why some people if they feel that a, a colleague is, is in a bubble um, simply won't talk to them in, unless perhaps that person decides to talk to them. So generally speaking flow is um, always linked to pleasurable experience, um, positive emotion and peak performance and there's a strong chance that the experience and the way it happens is a built-in reward circuit for for doing something at the limit of your ability and doing it well. And um, again, that would make sense if you wanted uh, to create a creature that would always push itself and always try to master its environment in the way that humans have mastered our environment. You would want to build in some kind of reward circuit for, for when they're doing good things. So. That's, uh, that appears to be something that flow achieves. And if we look at what intrinsic motivation is, it's something which is intrinsically rewarding, there's no external reward, it's just done for the enjoyment, and that fits the definition of flow very nicely. So um, there's a good argument to make there, and they come from different theories. Flow you know, is a theory unto itself, or a self-determination theory is a motivation theory. Uh, it's well, as you know, it's quite a sort of specific theory with with multiple strands. So it flows in to address performance and experience. Um, self motivation theory just addresses motivation, and yet they have this huge overlap. Um, and it might be that there's um, more to discover on that point. But the research we have at the moment, um, maybe it's just that people don't like to to cross paradigms or, or cross sort of school boundaries, but it, it seems to be underexplored whether they are in fact the same thing or um or, you know, perhaps they are different. So focusing on the controllability of it, it's frequently been reported as um coincidental and, and difficult to control. And yet um, a lot of the elite athletes that we interviewed did talk about trying to control it in terms of doing all the things that they believe lead to flow and, and setting their goals and preparing as effectively as possible, especially pre-performance routines, especially controlling their thoughts to remove the negatives and focus on positives, and as much as possible simply avoiding all the things that might distract them. Um, and as I said before, sometimes that might even include avoiding talking to a, a, a colleague or avoiding looking at the scoreboard. And the idea that we seem to get from the athletes is that um, if you get enough dominoes toppling it can it can tip into a flow experience. So if we were to try and generate a list of, of the things that um, lead to flow, of course uh, motivation would be on there and of course the appropriate level of arousal would be on there for whatever the task is and for whatever your um, particular preferences, you know, introverts and extroverts apparently have different preferences for arousal. Um, to try and focus as much as possible by having clear goals and trying to focus on the correct um, sources of feedback. Uh, planning as much as possible so that there's no surprises. Uh, if we overlap into achievement goals for a second, there was a study that was linked um, adopting task and mastery goals with, with flow experiences. Um, and it might just be that they're more controllable if you're focusing on um, aspects of the task and measurable, fairly objective um, aspects, that's more controllable than, than relying on 
uh, a competitor who could be performing very well or very badly, and if that is what you're judging your success off, then it makes flow more fragile. Great preparation is, seems to be key, um, and trying to put yourself in environments and trying to create conditions outside of you as well as inside of you, which are um, helpful. As much as possible, people need to feel confident, um, and that can be uh, genuine and something which is because of their um, ability, and it can be something which you try and manu manufacture and, and manage to make sure that the person feels confident on the day. Uh, where possible, you can try and make sure that the team uh, has positive interactions and there's no criticism um, and negativity, especially during performance moments, and to try and create you know, this so-called feel-good factor so that um, going into it there's no doubts, there's no queries, um, and the person doesn't feel sort of any fatigue or any motivation, they are as good as they can be, and that should at least maximise the chances of flow happening. So pushing at, at more opportunities um, to research flow, can flow happen without peak experience or without peak performance? Can it be a separate concept or must it always be where those two things overlap? Um, and you know, presumably, is it possible to have a peak performance without it being flow? I, I think almost definitely it is. In which case, what is the purpose of flow, and, and why is it not happening in all peak performances? Does the experience differ between sports? Do the causal conditions differ between sports? Uh, is flow different in an interactive team sport versus a highly individual sport? Um, is it different? Within different moments, can flow be um, within rugby? Can it be experienced differently in a rock and roll situation to a kicking situation? Is it different in golf between hitting a putt and hitting a drive? Does the nature of the experience differ, even for the same person, just because of different contexts? Can we design interventions that cause flow? This is the, the million dollar question. Um, and if we could, the chances are would be very popular. Um, and then there's this overlap with the concept of momentum. So uh, games very frequently, especially team games, swing back and forth between uh, each team being in control and having momentum. Uh, and is, are, is it the same thing or is it slightly different? And again, that's not really been addressed fully yet. We're still just grappling with it and trying to work out um, if how related they are. And then is it just such a thing as, a, as an authentic personality where people um, are, are prone to um, engage in things and find things rewarding for their own um, sake, for their own benefit, without needing intrinsic rewards? Is that person just uh, intrinsically motivated, or do they have kind of a, a disposition towards flow? And again, is it the same thing? There are so many concepts in sports psychology which. Um, overlap and where the overlap hasn't been addressed and so we end up with multiple different research teams and different um, theories, different terminology often referring to the same or potentially the same thing. This is just a small sample of the references that are out there, at least it allows you to, to go and look for those. I've put some up on Moodle as well and I hope that's um, a sufficient introduction to um, the flow research for you. Um, and if you want to know more, uh, we can speak or you can read. And it is an interesting area um, for, you to, for you to dig if that's where you choose to look. Um, thank you for listening and I'll see you again soon.